I would li like to now welcome to the stage um, Anne Mai, who is the Executive Director of Offshore Wind Energy for the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action uh, for the State of Victoria. Anne. Thank you, Ben. I might pour myself some water. Uh, thank you for the invitation to present here today, and that was a fantastic scene setting uh, from Minister Bowen. I am sure many of us have pulled an all-nighter to accelerate the delivery of offshore wind, so I think that was a pretty exact um, description of how we have been working at pace, um, especially here in Victoria. Before I begin my presentation today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am meeting you on, the Wurundjeri land of the... Um, uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, excuse me, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past and present and any Aboriginal Victorians or um, uh, First Peoples who are joining us today. As the Minister just um, acknowledged, Victoria is really pleased to be a member of Gower um, and we really want to thank Gower for welcoming Victoria as its first subnational member. We're keen to learn and share knowledge and information with Gower members and really build on the international experience that has been established in relation to offshore wind to date. We look forward to working with our regional partners to be able to together develop offshore wind and support all of our respective priorities and objectives across the APAC region. We hope that our leadership as a state in this space will encourage other subnational jurisdictions to come forward and participate in the Global Alliance. Excuse me, I'm just looking for my clicker. but nothing's happening. <laughs> oh, is it just this one? The bottom button? The green one. Thank you. Apologies, when I was meant to be getting my tutorial on how to use the clicker, I had to walk with the minister around the exhibition hall. <laughs> so... Just a bit, bit candid there. Okay, so I just wanted to introduce OWEV and who we are. So we are Offshore Wind Energy Victoria. I'm the Executive Director of OWEV. Um, and OWEV has been established to coordinate and drive the development of offshore wind sector in Victoria. We've probably already been um, working quite closely with many of you in this room in that uh, endeavour. Uh, we're a division of uh, the energy group in the Victorian Government Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Action. And as part of the new title that our department um, has received uh, after the Victorian election, you'll note it doesn't say climate change anymore, it says climate action. And we are wholly focused on contributing to reducing the emissions and meeting the Victorian government's uh, emissions reduction targets, as well as our renewable energy targets. You might already be aware of these targets, but I'll just reel them off for you just as a, a nice reminder. We have set targets of 65% renewable energy by 2030 and 95% by 2035. Our net zero emissions target following the election last year was pulled forward. So we are now looking at net zero by 2045, whereas in the past that was 2050. That brings us in line with many of the leading countries in the world um, and as a state we are very open about our ambitions to hit our 2045 target. We see offshore wind energy as playing a vital role in meeting our targets, but also supporting an orderly energy transition. <clears throat> That's why Victoria has set a goal of two gigawatts, at least two gigawatts, of offshore wind energy by 2032, four by 2035, and nine by 2040. And as uh, Minister Bowen uh, described, we know that are very, they are very tight timelines to work to, 
and we are indeed working at pace to meet them. We often get asked why offshore wind in Victoria, and I think it's pretty clear we have amazing resources, and um, those resources are, you know, quality resources. But in addition to that, we recognise it has valuable attributes in addition to the quality of the resource. It's complementary to onshore renewables because of its different generation profile. And um, in Victoria, that is uh, both an enriching and uh, uh, from a reliability perspective, a very valuable aspect of it to Victoria. It sits in the shallow seabed that is very um, close to our existing 500 kV backbone. And I'll go into our transmission asset um, uh, uh, capacity in a, a moment, but it is happy circumstance that we happen to have these amazing offshore wind resources in proximity to our 500 kV backbone, which is quite unique in the NEM. And as Minister Bowen just indicated, it provides unique opportunity for our regions and our communities to um, play a part in the energy transition and reap the economic rewards of that. So I just wanted to highlight um, uh, in this graph, or in this uh, picture, that in Victoria alone, we can see declared and proposed over 20,000 square kilometres of seabed. That is, a, that is a significant amount of seabed and opportunity for offshore wind. Um, and to the north, you could see also the New South Wales zones that have been declared or proposed in the Hunter and Illawarra. But Gippsland alone is 15,000, over 15,000 square kilometres. Now, we acknowledge not all of this may be um, appropriate for development once we've done our studies and once the um, risk has been uh, assessed around what is important for the environment and the community and other usages. But that represents a huge opportunity. And we're really um, eagerly awaiting um, the uh, advice of the offshore infrastructure registrar in assessing the applications it currently has in, um, in being able to award seabed licenses or feasibility licenses for that area. In the meantime, we can see that Gippsland has amazing momentum. And so to support that, OWEB is focused on several programs of work to enable us to be able to capture the opportunity that Gippsland represents. Uh, at this stage, we are looking to quickly develop and are developing our policy and regulatory design, auction and support mechanism design, sector development, including supply chain and workforce, regulatory and legislative enablers, um, engagement with the community and an approach to working with the community to ensure that social licence is um, built, maintained and preserved and working with our traditional owners in a partnership model to ensure that they also benefit from the energy transition. In addition to that, we work with our colleagues across government to coordinate the enabling infrastructure, which is not uh, in our remit, but is sitting in other portfolios. And that is the transmission and the port, the construction port and supporting ports. So we are in an evolving policy landscape and we've heard a few times throughout this conference that transparency and regular communication is very important to um, a successful delivery of offshore wind and a, a regulatory framework for offshore wind. So we have been developing implementation statements. These are informed by international lessons, feedback from developers in the industry, investors, supply chain participants, local communities, and our own government uh, advisors who understand how a regulatory framework can be accelerated. Our most recent implementation statement released in March this year was the commitment to take, included in commitment to take an industry-led approach to the development of the first tranche of offshore wind generation of at least two gigawatts by 2032. In terms of our legislation and regulation, the Victorian government will deliver a fit for purpose regulatory framework in three stages commencing this year. We recognise that reforms are needed to help enable the industry and assist parties in navigating a quite complex regulatory framework. 
we will drive economic benefits from the investment in offshore wind energy and look to provide those skilled jobs for Victorian workers, attract the investment and create the opportunities for industry in new supply chains, recognising that there will be strategic and competitive areas for us and that we can't capture the entire supply chain, but there will be more work for us to do in this space and we want to deliver those benefits to our workers. In addition to that, we have obviously um, been working very closely with VicGrid, who is coordinating the shared transmission and who have started um, the community consultation on connection points and transmission expansions to service offshore wind energy. We also work with the Department of Planning and Transport, um, to, who are responsible for the construction port, to establish the Victorian Renewable Energy Terminal at the Port of Hastings, which has been identified as the primary port. A number of you are probably already aware we've been undertaking over the second quarter of this year targeted market engagement activities, and we've gathered input from developers, investors, um, OEMs, regulators and financiers on what a best practice support mechanism looks like and what a procurement process should be to enable uh, the most certainty and the most momentum for offshore wind in Victoria. We've also, as part of that process, gathered thoughts on the design and specifications and requirements for the ports and the transmission. We understand that ongoing and meaningful engagement is vital as we look forward to releasing our implementation statement three later this year. We will continue to engage following implementation statement three as we look to commence our auction and competitive procurement process in the following year. So I just wanted to um, highlight that, and you've probably already seen this illustration before, the offshore wind assembly port at the Port of Hastings, which we call the terminal, um, we have assessed to have ideal uh, aspects and characteristics to serve as an offshore wind assembly port. Um, we see the terminal as facilitating the first tranche of offshore wind development in Victoria subject to required approvals. It has the channel depth and the uh, industrial land uh, and is ex uh, proximate to the offshore wind zones to service those projects. Um, we see this as the start of a port strategy and we are currently reviewing how uh, other ports could play a role in supporting and complementing the Port of Hastings. As I mentioned before, um, it's happy circumstance that as Victoria has been looking to the order and sequence in which it is developing its renewable energy zones, it finds in the Gippsland res and the southwest res of Victoria 500 kV backbone, which is um, a wonderful legacy from the 1960s when the SECV in its wisdom chose to build a very high voltage transmission backbone for Victoria that stretches across the state and has our main load, Melbourne, in the centre. So you can see that um, in this uh, illustration, the 500 kV backbone, which is the dark blue line, links the two offshore wind zones around Gippsland uh, and Portland to the load uh, of Melbourne and the regional node. That 500 kV backbone will require expansion and potentially upgrades to service the capacity required for offshore wind. But this is an incredible asset that we understand we're very lucky to have, um, but we are really focused on um, because we can see that we can leverage it into something fantastic for the state. We also see supply chain opportunities and um, recognise that we have an opportunity in Victoria to play a bigger role in the renewable energy supply chain. <clears throat> and we highlighted some in this slide for you. We can see that there will be fantastic opportunity in the ongoing O&M phase of our work and particularly if we're seeing these assets with a technical life of up to 35 years, 
that is a very long period for people to um, be able to uh, service and, and work with the wind farms, as well as the supporting infrastructure. We also have world-class R&D capability in Victoria, and we can be positioned to capture new emerging market opportunities in the sector. We know that there are already quite a few tertiary institutions that are looking to work together and with the TAFEs and Federation Uni in Gippsland to see how we can um, contribute to the uh, knowledge and the know-how um, and the IP that can help drive renewable energy development and manufacturing. Um, we also have a quite mature professional engineering services capability in our state with significant transferability into offshore wind. And of course, we have our existing oil and gas and thermal plant um, capabilities across the state and particularly in, uh, around the Latrobe Valley, which can be um, transferred and transitioned uh, into offshore wind, as well as a very uh, capable marine transport industry. I think as has been discussed earlier this morning, we recognise that offshore wind needs to be developed in a sustainable and successful way. And that success includes protection and respect for our environmental and cultural values. Um, Victoria prides itself on having a world-class uh, uh, environmental uh, biodiversity policy and framework, which we will work with communities and developers um, to uh, ensure that we uh, provide the right opportunities for offshore wind, but also protect the things of high value for the state and the country. Um, we understand there is significant Abor Aboriginal cultural heritage of value around the Southern Ocean uh, proposed region, uh, particularly Dean Ma, which uh, is formerly called uh, Lady Julia Percy Islands, I believe, but we call it Dean Ma and it is of significant importance to the local traditional owners in that part of the state. Um, they describe it as their Uluru, and so we must respect uh, the cultural values surrounding Dean Ma. Of course, there are the birds and the submerged environment in the offshore wind zones, as well as significant marine mammal migration paths that we will need to navigate. Um, and of course, bats and fish, and the fisheries are of significance as well. So as these um, species and uses need to be uh, understood and respected, um, we will be paying particular attention to how offshore wind um, impact from noise, construction, obstruction of pathways, vessel transports, impacts uses will be handled. So in conclusion, as Victoria progresses through its renewable energy transition, we'll continue to provide information to the market about the ongoing work we are undertaking to develop offshore wind through our implementation statements, which are released regularly and are in consultation with the industry. We're looking to ensure that the transition is both attractive to international markets and delivers for our communities, traditional owners and workers. We're really excited to progress our ambition and commitment to offshore wind, and we look forward to providing our next update to the market later this year in implementation statement three. If you would like to get in touch with OWEV at any time, you can contact us at this email address, and I look forward to meeting more of you at the conference this week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arne. And uh, for those people in the audience, I have to say that Arne and her team, uh, they've been exceptional ambassadors for Australia and Victoria in particular. They have visited to uh, the Wind Europe conference in Copenhagen uh, as a delegation to begin to attract the supply chain and begin to get people interested in uh, Victoria as a place to be. And so some, a lot of the international delegations that we actually have been able to attract from this conference, and actually the fact that we could have this conference at all was very much in part due to the, the uh, commitment uh, shown by Arne and her team at uh, Offshore Wind Energy Victoria. It is now morning tea time, but before we adjourn, we just have 
one short video that we'd like to play. Thank you. So we will resume in another 30 minutes from now. Thank you, everyone.